This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today I will be welcoming Molly Basler. Molly was the uh, cheerleading coach of Alley in The Karate Kid, celebrating its 40th anniversary. Overall, she will be my seventh guest from that movie. And uh, she was also in Mel Brooks' History of the World Part 1, where she was one of the game show girls in that. Um, she got out of the business, and she's now a health and vegan expert. And um, she has a, a cookbook out, which I love the title of this book. It is called The Yogini Linguini Cookbook, because it's like a cross yoga and vegan cookbook. You know, I love that title, and it's going to be a great conversation today. I can't wait. She even has San Francisco roots that I can't wait to get into with her. Also, I know a lot of people are excited about Ali Wong winning the Emmy last night. whoop de fucking do I came up with her in San Francisco stand-up, and I will never forget what she said at the, at the Brainwash Cafe 18 years ago to me. You know, I will never forget and never forgive it. You know, I said it before she was famous, and I say it now. But I don't want to be negative, okay? So yeah, here is my interview with Molly Basler. Hey, Molly, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good. How are you, Tommy? I, I am fantastic. This is such a great honor. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. I'm. I'm. Uh, it's fun to be talk about you know work that I've done, and I'm glad you reached out to me. Absolutely. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Well, I was always front and center in the sense of when I was in school, I was always, it's funny, I wasn't really doing the drama scene, but I was always doing skits and performing like in class mm-hmm. or like, you know, history. I would then play Queen Elizabeth or um, I would I would always put together these scenes um, to present to the class. And I was always also running for, I, I was always president of my class and mm-hmm. um, doing things like that, speaking uh, in front of the school. So I didn't really gravitate to acting until after, but I always knew I wanted to be an act. you know, I was going to go into acting. Mm-hmm. So I just didn't like the drama scene, especially in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, and plus, I, I, my first thing was modeling. I started modeling and then got directed into acting. Oh, okay. So you're born and raised in L.A.? Born and raised in L.A., um, you know, and I was, I just wanted to be in the Hollywood scene from the get-go. So I didn't go to college right away. I went, um, I went directly into, I, I got a job at Milking Pot restaurant as a hostess. Oh, yeah. I met a a waiter there. He told me about an acting class. Mm -hmm. So I started in with Richard Brander. Uh Um, And so I started studying, and then, uh, you know, I just started meeting all these people. I, on a modeling gig, I... I, I went, I met a photographer named Vince Conte, who introduced me to Robert Evans of Paramount. Yep. And Evans took me under his wing and started sending me to acting school uh, with Jeff Corey. And then I got signed with Nita Blanchard. Um, and I started working right away. The first thing I, I believe I was thinking about that, I was thinking, like, what was my trajectory? But I think I got a commercial... Winston, this is how long ago, because they were doing commercials for cigarettes. Winston Cigarettes, I got the lead. And then I got History of the World. And then I just started, you know, I did a lot of print work, you know, a lot of modeling stuff and commercials. I did a Winsdays hamburger 
Kroger's. I did a Kmart. I did catalogs. Mm -hmm. All the bad stuff. <laughs> huh? All the bad stuff. Fast food. I know. Is that, I know. I, what, what I do that now, and I'm a vegan. Yeah. So I don't eat meat or dairy. Like, oh my God. So, um, I did Coca-Cola. I did an ad for Coke. I did a poster for, I don't know, some car company. Um, so I was working a lot. I got into SAG. Um, and then I got, um, and then I didn't get Karate Kid until later. Right. Uh, and then I did an Unsolved Mystery, actually, which I just watched. Again, it was really good. I did a segment called Magnetic Attraction. Right. Not, an, uh, not a segment, an episode. So I did that, and I did a Malibu Summer. Um, I got questions and, about all of this, by the way. <laughs> so that, that's what, that's, you know, and then I got heavily into theater. I was doing theater stuff. I was... Yeah doing showcases, and I wrote a play that we put on in Hollywood, and, but it's sort of, um, you know, so that, that, and then I, uh, so I had some issues with substance, drinking and drugging, which, you know, I got sort of caught up in that whole scene, and. Yep, I I'm in there. Yeah, I sort of had to clean up my act, um. Sort of. I, I, yeah, I had to get sober and, you know, it was just, I, I really got lost in, <laughs> I got <laughs> lost in Hollywood, but I did. And think, because I think things happened for me really quickly. And then I did something really stupid. I, because I, when, I think right after I did The Karate Kid and I did the episode for Unsolved Mysteries and I did, I was working and then I took off to San Francisco. Yeah. You know, like, why did I, uh, you know, I, I, it was just, and I think I need, whatever. So that's, that's part of my story. Okay, I got plenty of questions now. So, <laughs> growing up in L.A., did you go to school with anybody famous? No, uh, I didn't. Oh, well, at USC, then I went back to school because I thought I needed to know what, um, I didn't have that much experience in theater and I wanted to get a good theater background so I auditioned and it's funny because I well I auditioned at USC because at this time they had a program the Bachelor of Fine Arts program that was re replicated as same as Juilliard right so it was a really great program they auditioned in five cities I honestly didn't think I was going to get in and I did so I started really and that's some um there were some famous people at USC. I mean, Ali Sheedy. Yeah. Uh, Tate Donovan. Yeah. Um, now, uh, oh, Grant Heslov, who's become a huge producer. Oh, my God, you went to school with Grant Heslov? <laughs> yeah. He's so good. You know, I never expected him to be an Academy Award winner, but he's, he's so good. <laughs> um, I didn't even know he won an Academy Award. Yeah, like something that he directed, I think, or produced, something like that. Yeah, I just saw him a year ago. I went to a USC reunion for the Bachelor of Fine Arts, and I, because, you know, what happened is, then I took some time off again. Um, that, there's always been these stop and starts with my career, which now I'm back on track, even yeah. though it's like, you know... Uh, I, I still, I love acting, I love writing, I'm writing a screenplay, I'm writing a memoir uh -huh. called Mollywood mm -hmm. um, that I want to do a one-woman show on, and I have an agent, uh, and then the strike happened, but um, I took some time off to get sober, and that's when I was teaching yoga and meditation, and I got heavily into the wellness program, but I was always doing videos, like I wanted a a vegan cooking show. I wanted to always be in front of the camera. I love being in front of the camera. So, mm -hmm. and then I had this, you know, revelation of, I'm an artist. Like, why, I need to be doing what I love. And then um, I ran for office, you know, which was, this, yeah. uh, you know, I ran for office, but at one of my fundraisers, there was a filmmaker there, and he came up to me and he said, why aren't you acting? And I said, well, I used to. And he said, well, you should 
go back to it. And that was my calling. I thought, you know what, you're right. So I put everything else away, and I got back into the game. Right. Um, so when you were uh, in Jeff Corey's class, like, uh, who were your classmates? Well, you know what? I, nobody, I, one of the other guys who was so talented, Neil, he was, he's another, you know, sad case of, he got involved with drugs and alcohol. I, uh, Jackson Brown, I was in class with Jackson Brown. Jackson Brown took acting uh, classes? <laughs> yeah. I remember sitting there, and I was doing a, we were doing an exercise. We were sitting on the floor, you know, in Indian style, and I turned, and there was Jackson Brown. I'm like, oh, hey. <laughs> so he was doing, yeah, some of these guys who I think wanted to get more comfortable, you know, in front of the camera or even on stage, you yeah. know, took acting classes. I mean, politicians now take acting classes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, look at them. They're good at it. Um, right. Did you study at the Comedy Connection? Yeah. And then I, after that gentleman, Alex, that filmmaker, came up to me, mm. I thought, okay, I got to get my chops, you know, going again. So I, uh, I joined, like, Actors Access and Casting Frontier, and I got a call. There was a call. Oh, and I got an agent right away. I've since changed, but I had an agent... Um, J.R. Dibbs from Maleki International. He sent me out on some calls for movies. Um, and then I, I got a, a call to audition for this improv group. So I went down and I auditioned and I got in. And so I was doing improv for a year, which was really, really fun. Um, but it's not my thing, but it got me... Um, I mean, if you can do good improv, you really can do anything. And it helps yeah. you in scene study. It helps you on set. If you need to improvise with your fellow actor. Um, I mean, it, like the Unsolved Mysteries, I was thinking about that. And I played a beauty queen who then was was in this obsessive relationship. And then he shit shoots her and she becomes a paraplegic. I mean, it was a great role because I went from... I got to play like all these variations, you know? Right. Not just you know, uh, someone pretty and in a relationship, but then she gets shot in her struggle with being a paraplegic, and then she gets, I mean, it was really cool. So, um, but I was thinking back at that, I think, I don't even think we had a script. So, um, although that that's because it was a crime, you know, it wasn't like a scripted thing, but we had to do, like, it was mostly improv. I mean, of course, the director helps you, but it's always good, I think, actors, you know, I always felt that, you need to be able to do theater and all that. If you can't do theater, to me, you're not a real actor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I think all these guys now, yeah. I mean, I don't even know some of them anymore. Even we were talking about this. My friend, Louis Fantasia, he's a great theater um, director. Yeah. He, I'm writing my screenplay with him. But, um, you know, actors don't know Shakespeare anymore. They don't know... Uh, they don't, a lot of them don't even go to acting class. Um, they're well, the, just like, I don't know, it's a weird, it's a, at least I don't know, I don't hear them talking about the craft of acting anymore. We now have influencers or, I mean, yeah. you you know what I mean? What do you feel about that? I think it's bullshit, the influencer thing, and I get lumped into it sometimes and it drives me crazy. Yeah, yeah. No, I know, that's true. I just think, um, it's a different, you know, it's a different time, but I, I, I really respect the craft of acting, and as an artist, it's, to me, it's all the same, whether you're in front of a camera, you're on stage. I mean, it's, of course, it's completely different modalities, but it's, uh, if you can do a great scene in front of a hundred people in an audience, a live audience, Right. You can do a scene in front of a camera because you, the the thing is about a camera, you get a bunch of chances to do a take. So if you're not there yet, if you you know if you let's say you're doing a really emotional scene and you can't cry mm -hmm. on cue, you, the director works with you, and then by the you know tenth take, you're there. But in theater, you don't have that luxury. You got to be there. Absolutely. Now sometimes you have to fake it. Sometimes you do. I did a play at USC. And 
I had to be, the, the scene opened, me on stage, and I was sitting on a park bench and I was crying. Like the opening scene was me crying on a bench. And I, sometimes I just couldn't get there, so I was backstage and I said to this guy, slap me. <laughs> <laughs> so I would cry, I'd say, slap me. And he was like, no, no, I can't. I was like, oh, so I just rubbed my eyes to make mm. them look really wet and red. And, I mean, there's certain tricks. Some actors, theater actors, would rub an onion in their eye, but I then just took the set, and I looked like I was crying. And then, of course, yeah. you have to emote the feeling of that. You can't fake that feeling. Mm -hmm. So how do you get cast in History of the World Part 1? Well, it's so funny. Well, I knew... There was a gentleman by the name of Jay Burton, who was uh, a comedy writer. Mm -hmm. And I met Jay, you know, we were these young actresses, and, and, and we would go to Richard Simmons' workout. All the actors' models went to Richard and the playmates. Uh -huh. and, and then we'd go to Nate Mel and eat breakfast. So we'd always meet people there. And Jay Burton was one of them, and Jay introduced me to Mel, and Mel cast me. Wow. I mean, it's funny, I knew, like, that's how I got uh, Karate Kid, too. I knew Steve Shagan, who knew, um, this is the director of Karate Kid. Uh, John G. Appleton. Yeah, yeah, John. Um, Steve and John were really good friends. And so I went in, I auditioned, but I, it, it, a lot of mine, not the modeling stuff, that I all got, but some of the movies, I got from who, I, you know, the connection. Now, Malibu Summer, I did not. That's a B film, though, and it wasn't even sad, but I wanted to work, so I did that. It was a lead role, too. Um, I got a really good review um, as an actor, me and the lead guy. What was it um, called? Malibu Summer. Oh, yeah, 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 that's on here. Yeah. And then I did a Lethal Weapon 2. Now... It's interesting because I still get residuals for that, mm -hmm. but I don't think I was, I never even saw Lee's Weapon 2. I don't think I went to the, I must have gone to the screening, cause as a, but I, you know, because um, I think I was cut out, but I still get residual checks, but that was also because I knew Dick Donner really well. I was good friends with Dick Donner. Right. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to we'll get to Lethal Weapon two, but like, um, so what, what do you remember about History of the World Part One? Like you're surrounded by all these legendary comedians there. I know, I know, it was so much fun. Um, nothing. I felt really. I was more excited than I didn't feel threatened in any way. Um, or one thing about. I I always I stepped into these things. I never thought I. I was always very confident, so I didn't feel, even though it's funny, because at that time, I, I don't even think I'd taken an acting class. But for me, it was just, you know, it was an easy role. You had to, you know, stand there, and, and Mel was so nice, he just directed us. In fact, I wanted to get in touch with him again. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I ended up, like, 10 years ago, I was, or maybe a little longer, I was dating someone, uh, this guy from ICM, ICM isn't even around anymore, but he was an agent, and we went to a screening at Lionsgate, and Mel was there, and Dom DeLuise, and Ann Bancroft, and like all, and I, I didn't go, I, w I didn't go say, hey, I was in Lethal Weapon, i uh, not Lethal Weapon, in History of the World, put me in, I, I don't know why I did, but I, yeah. I, I regret that, but, um, so it was really fun, and Mel was so nice, and when we went to the screening on the lot of Fox, it was so packed, and he, my, I brought my parents, and he was just so gracious to my parents, and he remembered their names, like when he came back around, and mm -hmm. um, he was just really nice, and it was just fun, because he's a really fun, down-to-earth guy, and all of his, you know, all those people on set were the, the same. But yeah. I'm going to tell you a story. Was, um, my friend Jay Burton, who mm -hmm. introduced me to Mel, he, um, the joke was, 
that people on set on a Mel Brooks film would say, oh, how did you get this role? And they'd say, oh, I'm Mel's dentist. Oh, and the guy would say, oh, I'm his lawyer. And then the other would be, person would say, oh, I'm his doctor. <laughs> so he <Yeah>. always cast <laughs> his friend. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, let's see, I've interviewed Lou Mulford. She was one of the uh, many Vestral Virgins in the movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, of course, uh, Gianna Kehoe, who's a reality TV star now. Back then, she was Gianna uh, Tomasina. She was a Vestral Virgin as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. But, like, oh, my God, we just lost Shecky Green, who's in the movie. And he's got that hilarious moment where uh, Madeline Kahn says to him, the servant waits while the master baits, and then they both break the fourth wall with priceless faces. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That, it was really a funny movie. I love I love Mel Brooks, and one of my favorite films he did yeah. later on was called Life Stinks. I love that movie. Oh. Ooh. I love, and you know what? It didn't do very well, but I thought it was one of his best. I think so, too. I think it is his best. And that whole idea that money doesn't buy everything in him, as, and then and what was her name? That actress? Uh, Leslie Ann Warren. Well, yeah, she was so good as that homeless woman, and her name was Molly. Yeah, her name was Molly, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's funny, you know, as offensive as Blazing Saddles has been deemed, this is like a compa companion piece to that because it's equally as offensive, and that's why I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he was, I mean, Mel Brooks was really amazing. I mean, how about the producers, one of his earlier ones? Oh, God, you couldn't do that today. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and Young Frankenstein, I think, is a masterpiece. I, I love that. Silent Movie, which was not a big hit, but it's a good movie overall. Uh, lots of uh, visual slapstick. And High Anxiety, the Hitchcock parody he did. Uh, to Be or Not to Be. Uh, there's a lot of great movies he did. I love Spaceballs. Spaceballs is great, yeah. <laughs> the whole parody on... Star Wars. Star Wars. I love that. No, I think he's. I think he's great. And I heard, you know, they they were doing. I wish I had known when they were doing the the whole. They were, did the remake of History of the World Part Two. Yeah, on the Hulu. I haven't seen it, but I'm going to. Yeah, I, w I would have loved to have participated in that, but I, I I need to get like alert my agent to start looking for things like that for the you know. Yeah. For, any come arounds to be back on that and um, I'm just reaching out to you know and a lot of the people like Jay Burton has passed away um, some of these names um, that you know I, 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 I need I, 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 it would be good for me to reach out to Grant Hefloff who I went to school with and, yeah you know yeah, that would be, that'd be cool. Yeah, uh, Mel, Mel is going to be uh, honored at the Academy Awards. I just hope, you know, he, you know, he makes it because he's, he's going to be 98 this year. I hope he makes wow. it. Wow. Yeah, he should have been honored years ago. I know. I, I, had, I thought he was 90, but okay, 90. 98. 90. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I hate about the, the the award shows. It's such a popularity contest, you know, and these old guys aren't going to be around forever. You know, you got to give it to them, you know, while they're still mobile, you know, and he should have gotten it years ago. That's all I got to say about that. I know. And then Robert Evan, who produced, you know, The Godfather. Chinatown, Marathon Man. Yeah, I mean, he was, and they never gave him a tribute at the Academy Awards. And then finally, last, I think it was last year. I don't necessarily watch the awards unless I, I don't know. It, it depends on how inspired I am. But last year I was at a big party and we, they were on. And Coppola and I think it was Pacino and De Niro. Like they finally, um, they thanked Robert Evans for his contribution in getting The Godfather made. And it's like, oh my God, I mean, without Evans, it wouldn't have been made. Yeah. <laughs> it's, have you seen the documentary about Robert Evans, The Kid Stays in the Picture? No, I watched a little bit of it, but I, I didn't. I didn't. I should because he was. I, I was. I was very close to Bob Evans for like ten years, mm -hmm. and then um, I just, you know, and I look back. I wish I had been more aggressive in 
You know, I sometimes felt funny with people I knew, like Dick Donner and Evans, and like asking. Now I, I would be like, "Hey, put me in a movie. Let me read for this. Let me do that." But at the time, I was always so cautious, you know. And um, so I wish I had had been more direct in my asking for things like that for the people that you know were my good friends. Um, yeah. Oh, if I had a nickel for every person on this podcast who says, I wish I was more aggressive back then, I'd be rich right now. <laughs> oh, really? Everybody says that. Yeah, you, you know, you think, oh, yeah, I'm going to... And then I sort of got out of it. Um, I, I sort of got... I don't know. I would call... You know, I'd be on these things, and then I'd feel like, you know, Hollywood was sometimes just so... I don't know. When that whole thing happened with Evans... Mm-hmm. So with Cotton Club, you know, he was indicted for murder. You know that? Oh, yeah, 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 I heard about that, yeah. yeah. And that sort of freaked me out that it just was so dark. Yeah. And I, I couldn't, like, I just was, I don't know, there was there's some real, I, I, at the time, I just couldn't handle uh, that. And I look back, and I wasn't a good friend of Bob because he was very scared and freaked out and he was losing everything and I just sort of, I just disappeared and never, we didn't talk again for like 20 years. Yeah. Um, so I just always felt bad about that. But sometimes the, the whole scene, you know, I mean, murder, coke, like I just, I couldn't handle some of it sometime, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a crazy town. A lot of crazy things have happened. I mean, I don't even know, though, anymore. Like, I don't hear, but I'm not in it like like I used to be. Uh, yeah, you know, um, but I don't know if, if, like, are people still doing, like, the whole drug scene in Hollywood? It, it seems like everybody's now doing yoga and clean and they're definitely do- doing that. I mean, if they are doing drugs, they're not telling anybody now because the internet is out. Right. I mean, yeah. And if anybody takes a picture, it's a whole new. I mean. I mean, everyone's well, smoking pot because it's pretty much legal now. But other than that, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't hear the bad. You know, like they're really wild. You know, people just get really wild. And the whole Playboy Mansion scene, and I mean, everybody was just coked out. Yeah. <laughs> drugged out, uh, drinking, you know, it was just... People were having quickies in public. <laughs> it was just like, oh my God, it was a whole different, whole different time. Now it's like, you know, everybody, everything is, anything you say is politically incorrect. And, oh, um, drives me crazy. Yeah, I mean... I mean, even things that I I said on on my earliest episodes of podcasts, I wouldn't even you know say it like that nowadays, you know. But like, yeah, I mean, I I think turning forty has matured me in many ways. But like at the same time, it's just like, yeah, I don't believe in political correctness. <laughs> you know what? I don't either. I mean, certain things, yes. Like I wouldn't say. And I, but I've always believed in political correctness in the sense, but if, if, it, if you're a comedian mm-hmm. and you say something racy or whatever or about transgender, I mean, if it's not done in a bigotry way right. and it's just about, I can't describe it, like, well, they, they, a different, if it's not mean intended or... I can't, I, you know what I mean? I can't describe it. I mean, as a writer, yeah, and as a, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm sure comedians, you know, they still say some pretty, they say some stuff that could get them in trouble. But it's, you know, that it's also freedom of speech. Thank God for America, right? We have right. that. We have the freedom of speech. That's why I pretty much stopped doing comedy in the last six years. It's just, it's just not where it was before. Yeah, I'm supposed to do an open mic at, um... Flappers? Huh? Flappers? No, it's in Venice, called X Factor. Oh, I don't know that. Yeah, I know. It's at the Electric Lodge on the... I don't know now if I'm going to do it. I, um... I honestly don't know what I was going to... I was going to read some of my material from Mollywood, this memoir I'm writing about, Mm -hmm. you know, and... 
Evans is in there and all the people that I knew. And there's, and then the, I have one called Sex, Drugs, and Richard Simmons. <laughs> uh, and, you know, all about the whole scene that I was in for a very long time. You know, it was like I would sort of get out of it and then I'd be back in, sort of get, you know. Um, I was very close to Peter Bogdanovich mm-hmm. and um, Louise Stratton, who... Um, is Dorothy Stratton's sister? Yeah. And so I haven't talked to Louise in a while. Peter passed away, which I was very sad about. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, this, that whole era of, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I'm writing about. And like I said, I want to write a one-woman show, then to promote the book. We'll see what happens. I'm writing it, and... Um, I've been submitting it actually to publishers, and then I'm writing a screenplay, not not about Hollywood at all. Um, and then I'm, you know, hopefully going to start going on auditions. I, I had a couple before the strike, but mm. I, you know, I got, um, went on, a, I, I don't even know, I think it was for a TV show, I played a doctor, mm-hmm. and... Then, boom, the strike happened. The writer's strike, and then the actor's strike. It was like, oh, my God. So I haven't gone on anything since. Oh, and then there was the holidays. You know, so. Right. But... So in, in the Karate Kid, I mean, you're you know you're you're barely seen as the as the cheerleader in the movie. Did you have anything that was cut? Yes, there was more, but I don't. You know, it was interesting that too. I know. I. I I just watched that clip. I watched it again, and I thought, "Oh my God!" Now, now I would have said, "Hey, I want more. I want more films. You know, I want more in my scene." But I didn't, yeah. and I could have told Steve Shagan to ask John, but I didn't. So, yeah, but you know what's really weird? We filmed what? at Hughes Junior High School, where I went—not high school, Hughes Junior High—and I went to school there. Mm-hmm. So we filmed place where I went to school, and I remember being sort of disgruntled, because I wanted a bigger role. I did want a bigger role, and John had already cast, you know, he had cast the people. He he cast me later. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I, you know, but, you know, I did it, and... I wish I had had more time, but I I don't really remember. I think, yes, there was, yeah, there was more of me working with the girls on Cheers, you know, and, um, and then I say, then we broke, we break. So, yes, the scene was longer, but they cut it, and then all I got was that one line. I still get residuals for that. Yeah. Uh, I still get residuals for History of the World, Karate Kiss, um, Lethal Weapon 2, Unsolved Mysteries, um, it's unbelievable. I mean, but if I had gotten bigger roles and so forth, um, it would have been better, you know? And mm-hmm. I did some things, like I told you, when I moved to San Francisco, I had an agent up there. I did commercials, did some modeling work. Um, I did an industrial film for Levi Strauss. Um, I think the last thing I did before I went into Silverland was, um, it was called Dino Island. It was actually really cool. We, we went on location. Dinosaur Island? Dino. It was a commercial for, oh, okay. um, a, a ride for Dino, Dino Island. Mm-hmm. It was a, it was a ride in some theme park. I don't even, but it was really cool. So, I played a scientist. That was really fun. We went out on location, and the director was really cool. And um, I might have done some print. I always had an agent. I always had a print agent. I had KSA models. Uh, I did a thing for Barbie, actually, a print ad about Barbie the doll. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and then I just sort of, I had to, you know, get my... um, life together and that's what I was doing uh, getting sober and also finding my voice 
um, as a, you know, a sober woman, as a sober person. It's very different mm-hmm. um, than when you're sort of lost. So I was just sort of pushed into it, and everybody was telling me who I was and what I should do. And, mm-hmm. and I had, I, you know, you have to find out that. And if I had been more directed by my parents, which I wasn't, my parents were on their own trip. You know, my brother had died in a um, motorcycle accident, and they were all, you know, depressed. And I didn't have a lot of support. I believe as an actor, any artist, need, and I'm telling you, and I'm sure you know this, mm-hmm. most of the major movie, the, the movers and shakers in Hollywood all had a huge support group, like their family, a, an agent who believed in them, a manager who walked them through, because when you get into that, everybody wants something from you. Mm-hmm. And if you are, and then giving you drugs and, dr- you know, and if you're not protected by someone, mm-hmm. you just get eaten up, which that's what I sort of happened to me. But I sort of come out of it again. And then I went back to school, I went to USC, uh, but I still was too involved in Hollywood. I needed time to, like, learn my craft. And, and then I moved, that's when I moved up to San Francisco of... Uh, First time I finished college at Mills College, um, mm. but I was always doing theater out, and, and you know, like I said, commercials. I always had an agent, and then um, um, so that that was my journey. But I, if you don't have that support and someone watching you, and like, I mean, you hear a lot of the Academy Awards. Oh, I think my mom. I think my family. I think you know. I didn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just sort of thrust in this world and started getting a lot of success really fast. And then I just did not know how to deal with it, you know. And then I got yeah. involved. And then it was all, the whole drug thing. If you're an alcoholic druggie, you know, you get lost in that world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some absolutely. people, you know, go, like... You know the names um, who've gotten sober, you know, and have kept their careers together, but they all had support. Mm-hmm. You know? Do you ever watch uh, Cobra Kai, the Karate Kid series? No, I watched some of it, but I, I, I think the original was the best. So Lethal Weapon 2, like, okay, you do Richard Donner, you said, and who did you play in that? Because it's not on your IMDb. I know, because I think it was in the cut. I played, you know, it was a stupid role. I wish mm-hmm. I had, like I said, um, I wish I had, you know, uh, asked him for a bigger role, but I didn't. He, uh, I was a, you know, a girl in the jacuzzi, uh, and Mel Gibson comes over, uh, and he chats us up. I forget, he was... It was, it was shot over here in Century City at the Fox Tower. Um, it was just kind of a stupid scene, a scene that led into Mel. He was doing, he was at this hotel or something doing, I don't know, investigating right. someone. And then we were there in the jacuzzi and he comes over and we kind of, I mean, it was so typical, like girl in bathing suit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and like I said, now I would have been more forthright and said, hey, I want a bigger role, put me in here. And, and Dick was uh, a good friend of mine. I could have, and he did a lot of movies. So, but, you know, I can't look back and go, all I have is now. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any um, anecdotes about Robert Stack on Unsolved Mysteries? Did you ever meet him? Uh, no. I, I just, no. I, I, no, I didn't. I, um, I'll send you that link of that Unsolved Mysteries. It's really good. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. How about, um, Mal, so Malibu Summer, you know, it's, it's funny. I've seen so many movies from the 80s, 90s with that, with, that, with that similar kind of title. But this one I don't recall. So you were the lead in it, you said. Yes. And you can Google it, and it will come up. But there are a lot of Malibu Summers. Um, but... There's, um, 
It is. It's on my IMDb. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm looking at it, but like, there's no synopsis or anything. No. Oh, yeah. It's about a group of women, girls, uh, college girls, going, and we're in Malibu for the summer. We have to make money, mm-hmm. and we come up with this idea of a fantasy. Like people call us. Uh, to live out their fantasy. And it's not sexual stuff. It's more like one guy wanted to save a drowning girl like and feel like a hero. So um, I pretended to be drowning, and then he came and rescued. And then another guy wanted to be Robin Hood with, maid, with his maid, Miriam. Like, and we, we did so silly. We created these silly, <laughs> <laughs> these silly fantasies for these people to live out. And that, that was our business. Yeah, and well, I was the lead. I had, a, and but it was so low budget. I ha, I actually had a blast though on it. Um, I just wanted to work, and you know I just wanted to be in front of the camera and and work. And the it, but the guy, our director, I'll never forget. He said, "You got to." He said, "Don't mess up because we 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 can't do many takes." So I mean, we couldn't do a lot of takes. It was like you had to hit your mark, say your line, and be on it or you know so but I had fun because it was like theater for me mm-hmm. Cause that's what you had to do in theater you know right um, you had to get, hit your mark and get it while the audience was out there same thing so I had a blast and uh, but um, at the time I used a pseudonym a different name because um, it wasn't SAG it was a non-union yeah. project and I was SAG, and they don't look kindly at that. But really, I, it was no big deal. I could have used my real name. They were, you know, I'm not like a major star. They wouldn't have known anyway. But I used the name called. I called myself Red Sinclair. Mm-hmm. So you won't see my name, which, um, which I sort of regret doing that too, because at least it's a it's it's a body of work, and it was not. It was a kind of, like I said, it was a wonky film, but my performance was good. Awesome. <laughs> Maybe I could find it on YouTube or something. Um, yeah, you, so you have a cookbook out called the, the Yogini Linguini Cookbook. I love that title. It has a real, like, old-timey ring to it. So it's all your recipes? Yeah, I mean, so what happened is then I got really involved in wellness and yoga and teaching yoga, and I became a vegan, and I sort of woke up from this, you know, very selfish, um, I mean, not everybody in Hollywood is selfish, I'm not, because a lot of them are doing great work and they give a lot. I was, I was so caught up, though, in the scene that I did, I lost my way, I lost because I was always a person, too, who was helping people. Um, I was feeding the homeless. I belong, you know, and then um, and then I just sort of lost. I, I wasn't doing that anymore, and I was, um, well, I shouldn't say that. I did do some work, but I wasn't very involved with the world. Like, I didn't really know what was going on with the world. Like, most of the time, I didn't even know who the president was. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was so... <laughs> um, and then it's so funny because then I became very political. And once I woke up and um, I, I and then I became a vegan, I was marching for the animals. I became very proactive for, you know, helping people, planet, and animals. That was my whole thing. So... Yeah. Then I, yes, I came up with all these recipes, and I wanted a, ve- what, I wanted a show. I wanted a vegan cooking show, or I wanted it, and I, I did, I did all these demo reels. I was sending them out. I did a, I, I spent a lot of money on filming these things, and we did a, I shot one out at the farm sanctuary, and, like, outside of Santa Clarita, up off of the five, and so I wanted this whole thing about bringing, you know, people that, that what we put into our body, I know, it was very, nobody had done it before, so I was mixing, you know, vegan cooking with yoga and meditation, I did this whole, you know, film, I filmed it, and then I was sending it around, and 
I just couldn't get any traction. Plus, I didn't have an agent at the time to help me. Um, but, yes, I wrote a cookbook that went along with my whole program. And I sold it. I still have some. And um, my plan is when I get published with Molly Wood and my other things that I'm doing, mm -hmm. I want to get that eventually published. And... Because it's got great recipes, and it's for, like, the beginner vegan, and they're really fun. And then I add some exercises in there, like while you're chopping the salad, you do some squats, or you stand on one leg for balance. And, you know, it's all, it's all integrated. Like, when you're cooking, you might as well be working out. Oh, that's cool. And it sounds like, you, you know, life is better for you now. Yeah, I mean, yes. I feel really good. I feel, um, I feel, I don't know. I'm doing it on my terms. I know who I am. Um, I know, I know now what I really want. I mean, I always did, but it was always unclear. Someone told, you know what I mean? Uh, I just feel now, um, you know, like I said, I have an agent. I talked to her. It's like, okay, this is what I want. Um, I'm going to try to get in touch with some of the people that I've known. So if they're doing a film, um, I, I, you know, I could be put, you know, I'm Quentin Tarantino. I, I used to spend time with him and some other people. Mm -hmm. And I know he's going to be doing his, what, what's his, like his last film. So I'm going to try to get in touch with him um, to... You know, so I could read for something, or yeah. you know, I, and, and <clears> I, <throat> I want to use some of my contacts that are still around, um, because I just don't want, um, as Wayne Dyer used to say, I don't want to die with my music still in me. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. You know, I mean, I have. No, oh, I, I love acting. I love, like I said, I love the craft of it. I love writing. I love, I, I just, I, I think it's such a great expression of, of, our, of our humanness. And I never really realized that until now. You know, I also play music. I play the banjo. I wrote music. I mean, to me, someone who is in the arts usually... You know, we write, we act, we can play a, a musical instrument, we dance. I'm also now dancing to make some extra money. It's a side hustle. I'm dancing in a dance troupe, mm -hmm. uh, ethnic cultural dancing, and I did. Uh, it's really a fun. So, but I just, and it was during the strike. I was like, I want, I gotta be performing. You know, it's, it's like when that. My passion got reignited with acting and the, well, it always was because like I said, even with my cooking, I was always in front of a camera. I was trying to get a cooking show and I was trying to, and then I realized it was because I'm, I'm an actor, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, that's, you know, so I, I was always doing that. And then when it got, when I got, when it got reignited, um, it just makes sense that, um, you know, then I went back into it, and that, and then of course my, I, I'm just so it, when I don't, when I'm not on stage now, when I was in the improv group, it feeds you in a way. Now I, I do think most actors, even if they don't admit it, but um, there is a sense we like the applause, we like to be in front of an audience, we like the attention, we I like being in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. uh, some people hate it. <clears throat> know yeah. I love it and so I was always trying to do that and then when the improv I stopped doing the improv when the chance to be a dancer and a performer came up and was also during the strike I said I'm in I'm going to do it and so it's been fun I haven't had a lot of performances yet because I was new in the ensemble so I have to learn all the dances mm -hmm. but um, so I'm doing that too I did we're going in February to up to Palm Desert. We're dancing in a Greek festival. Nice. Um, so I'm doing, you know, and then I'm gonna actually today I'm gonna write my agent, see what's going on with her. Um, but 
Yeah, I and and so I'm doing these various side hustles. I we call them side hustles. Um, and hopefully I'll get a get you know a good gig. And I would love to read for Yellowstone. I mean, there, what's also opened up. There's so much content now because of streaming. Now, I don't necessarily, I think streaming has also sort of killed the art mm-hmm. filmmaking. Um, I think that it's just, you know, I feel like I'm watching a HBO or Showtime movie every time I watch a Netflix or, or Amazon movie. And I like those mo- those kind of movies, but I want a cinematic experience. It's not cinematic. Right. That's true. That's true. No, there's nothing like a big, the big movie screen. I love going to movies. I mean, that was the whole, going to see a film used to be an experience. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You'd go. Yeah, definitely. You know, you'd, get, you'd get your popcorn, you'd get your, you know, red vines, your, and then you'd go sit and the lights would go down. I mean, it was so cool. Now, I mean, I've been going to screenings because I'm SAG, so I've got this, I've been going, and I saw Maestro with my friends. I saw Oppenheimer. Some of the films are too long now, though. It drives me nuts. Um, and American Fiction. I was going to go see Boys in the Boat, but I didn't want to go by myself, so I nixed that one. Um, <laughs> but that's what, you know, so, yes, I love it, but I think streaming... Yeah, you you know now it's so easy to turn yeah put your Netflix on, uh, watch a movie, uh, and then forget like oh yeah I could go to the theater down the street you know but mm-hmm. hopefully it's not going to be a completely lost art I mean there's some really great I did see Scorsese's um, uh, the killer what the flower the killers of the flower moon yeah yeah. That was really good. I must say, I wasn't, I was reluctant to see it because I thought, oh, it's three and a half hours, but it was really amazing. And I was so appreciative, like, he's just such a great filmmaker, you know? He is. He always will be. Oh, it's like, you know, and those, I never saw Barbie. I've noticed already see Barbie. I think that I saw the trailer. I noticed already see that. It's anti-male from what I heard. (laughs) Well, it's just silly. I mean, I never liked Barbie as a kid. I never played with Barbie. I thought it was ridiculous. And then to make a whole movie about her. I don't know. Whatever. So it just wasn't my thing, but it made a lot of money. But I think it also shows where our world's at. Um, You know, in the terms of what, you know, what people are going to see. I mean, Barbie, like, instead of something like... An um, art house film. Huh? Like an art house film. Right. Yeah, and that was my thing, too. I always loved, like, um, I love, you know, like, I'm like, well, I'm an artist, so I loved, like, little theater and making something happen out of nothing, you know, like mm-hmm. getting people together and, you know, at artists, and the, that's when I did move to San Francisco for a summer. I was going to SC, and I hung out with all these artists, and one was writing a novel, and, you know, we would just sit in the evenings, we'd go to poetry readings, and um, I love that. I was more like a real bohemian, um, the written word, reading, I, I, I love all that, mm-hmm. and um, you don't hear a lot about that although it's still going on there's people doing that you know but you don't hear about it as much um also because la is so big you know i don't i'm not in those i i'm getting now in the scene of all those things like readings and open mic nights and because i do want to participate in that um yeah but yeah and i love the the smaller movies too the um i always loved the, um, you know, and I loved Fellini and Salvador. Did you ever see Fellini's films and Salvador Dali films and these guys who were like... I've seen Fellini, not Salvador Dali. I didn't even realize he made films. Yes, art films that were nuts. Yeah. They were so cool. They were almost, yeah, they were like a movie. And obviously, a, you know, a movie is a, it's a moving piece of art. 
So it would make sense that some of these guys at the time um, were making, you know, movies of their art. They were crazy, but they were, uh, you know, and they didn't necessarily have a through line or a script. They were just images that were very interesting and tantalizing. I will definitely um, check those out. But uh, real quick, we got to play by Secret Silly Game. This is a series of silly celebrity party questions. It's no win or lose. It's just pure fun. And how the game works is, Molly, I ask you the question. You answer it. Then you ask me that exact same question, and I answer it. And feel free to comment on the answers, because they might be funny. Okay. Molly, are you ticklish? Tommy, are you ticklish? Yes. If you tickle me without warning, though, I might hit you in the groin. <laughs> <laughs> is your belly button an innie or an outie? My belly button is an innie. And what is your belly button, Tommy? Innie or outie? It is also an innie. <laughs> uh, what color are your toenails painted? Right now, at the time, my toenails are not painted. I've gone El Naturel. Yep. Same here. Yeah, are, are your toenails painted? They are also au naturel at the moment. Uh, what would you say is your best personality trait? I think... I... Well... I, it's joyful, a personality... Joyful and fun. I'm, I can... Yeah. I, mean, I can I can make things. I remember a friend of mine said, "Molly, you're the only person who can make taking out the trash fun." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, those are I'm fun and um, and joyful. I find also in the simple things I can find a lot of joy and have a lot of fun doing really simple things. Okay. And then for me. Well, what about you? What about you? I have empathy, and I have no filter. Oh, that's cool. I'm a Gemini, so... <laughs> My brother's a Gemini. Oh, yeah? I'm June 6th. Yeah, he's May. He's in May. Late May. Yeah, next girlfriend of mine was also late May. Um, if you could have anything named after you, what would it be? Great question. I would think a... Can I have more than one thing? Oh, yeah. Go uh, ahead. Name several. <laughs> I would like to have a forest, mm -hmm. trees named after me, a bridge, uh, any uh, connecting something, you know, a bridge, mm -hmm. and maybe a theater. Okay. What about you? A vibrator. Really? Yeah, I would call it the Tommy Chatsy. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? I would have to say, uh, in, in public bathrooms, after someone has gone number two, th yeah. that makes me gag. Or in a yoga room, yeah. someone uh, passes gas and has eaten something terrible, like, I can really, I, I get really, that's why I don't like public bathrooms, I have a thing about them, like, um, so that, that I would have to say is my, you know, or also, um, trash, like, really bad, rotting trash. Yeah. That, um, <laughs> What was that? Yeah, and well, I've never smelled a dec decomposing body, but that's supposed to be like one of the worst. Yeah. <laughs> so, and what about you? Either farts or feet. Farts or feet? Yeah. <laughs> stinky feet. Oh, that's true. I haven't smelled stinky feet though in so long. Oh, that's good. You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Mine are always so clean. I have to get, um, yeah, I usually, though, when I do get my toenails, I had to give them a rest. Uh-huh. If, if you paint your toenails too much, they can turn yellow. So in winter, oh, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not wearing open-toed shoes. 
I usually go al natural, but you, a lot of the time I do a French tip. Yeah. So I have a joke for you. What? You know the difference between a dildo and tofu? Uh, no. They are both meat substitutes. Funny. I do. You'd like that because you're a vegan. <laughs> That's right. I was thinking about. It's funny because tofu comes in different. You know, it comes in soft. It comes in firm. I was trying to think of something like that. But um, yeah, my dogs are vegan too. <laughs> so your website is www.mollybasler.com. Yes. Okay. Molly, thank you so much for coming on today. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and be safe out there, and see you on Facebook. Okay, thank you. It was fun. Yes, a lot of fun. <laughs> Talk to you later, then. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Molly Basler, Asia sweetheart. What an interesting force. I'm glad we could have that conversation today. <laughs> She's very interesting. She's far more interesting than I expected her to be. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes! <laughs>